So welcome back guys to my casual Sunday lore session where I just do some casual gameplay as well at the same time as chatting about some general lore points without really kind of being scripted, having a relaxed session. So grab a coffee and let's relax on Sunday together. Now from last time my characters, I've just uh, cleared the area essentially and um, if you look at my character I've leveled them up to 16, no particular build in mind just some strength and faith kind of split build with my mace at plus two. Now the first topic I want to talk to you guys about today before I get into quite a lengthy Q&A that I've got is about Lothric and how it essentially is the embodiment or the legacy of the old lords and the old lords kingdom in a lot of ways. It is a kingdom in general where the institutions expose the kind of what the ways that the old gods did and that's a good start to my gameplay in that they believe in the relinking of the fire in general and part of the reason this is is because a member of the old royal family actually is part of the Lothric royal family and that is Guinevere. Now I talked about this in a previous video of the royal blood but for the benefit of those who want a refresher I'm of course referring to the Queen of Lothric who is in fact Guinevere now this divine blessing item was an item in Dark Souls 1 and in Dark Souls 1 it was associated with Guinevere as kind of a blessing of hers and in the item description in Dark Souls 1 she's referred to as a goddess of bounty and fertility and you can see here in the Dark Souls 3 item description it is more or less exactly the same the Queen of Lothric was initially revered as a goddess of fertility and bounty so the Queen of Lothric and Guinevere are one and the same. They're both goddesses of bounty and fertility. It's just that she has taken on a new role, and a new title in a lot of ways. And it's a lot of reason why I don't like Guinevere. And you kind of see that in my, in my previous video. And that I feel like she is someone who, she, yes, she keeps the message of the old gods alive, whether you think that's good or not. But she essentially abandons failing worlds to their fate at the kind of cusp of everything going wrong, as she did in Dark Souls 1. That wasn't the real version that we meet in Dark Souls 1, it is of course an illusion uh, of Gwendolyn's. And she in fact already left with the other gods when everything was essentially going to ruin. And here she's done the same, Lothric uh, essentially falls and she's already moved on um, after her, her, first, her last born child was born. And that's what I want to talk about. Um, not only the legacy of, of Gwyn in, in Lothric, but also how it falls and the reasons for that. And in doing so, I will answer one of my Q&A questions. Now, one of the Q&A questions I got was from Travis Parson. Uh, and essentially he asked, sorry, I'll stop playing while I read this. A friend of mine was watching me play Dark Souls 3 and asked me what is up with all the empty husks of Lothric knight armor lying everywhere. I don't exactly know how to answer this question. Uh, thanks for that question, Travis, and uh, that, that will be answered in my kind of main discussion about Lothric. So Lothric is your kind of, in a lot of ways, your run-of-the-mill European kind of inspired medieval uh, monarchy. It's ruled by the royal family, which exposed the old ways of the old gods. And they have a lot of strong beliefs, they have a strong authoritarian kind of ruling body, these three pillars... Uh, of the king as well as of course a royal family and much like old Christian medieval societies they're very intolerant of ideas that don't kind of fit into that dogma where the king is kind of the embodiment of the divine and if you don't follow the official religion you're essentially not you're not going to be accepted and this is part of the reasons uh, that Lothric that one of the factors that contributes to its downfall so I'm just going to speak to Grey Rat here before I continue on that point. Yes, we're not a jailer. We've been awoken by the bell. Do you have any comments on that? We are some of that in Kindle Dash, as we discussed last week. And now he refers to his town, so I'll just skip through the rest of the chat. It's not exactly hugely important at this point. I'm going to grant his request, because I kind of like Grey Rat. He's a very likeable character. So we've got that, and we're going to just uh, go ahead and equip that blue tearstone ring, because why not? Alright, 
so carrying on from where I left off, yeah, they're very strong, kind of authoritarian, and they're ruled by the three the three pillars essentially on behalf of the king and the royal family. And uh, Guinevere has brought the old the old rule and the old uh, way of thinking, and we can see that reflected by the fact that the soldiers of Lothric, in fact, worship the the warriors of Sunlight Covenant, which is that kind of warrior Gwyn aligned covenant the you know with Gwyn's first born son and it you know it very much shows that those kind of beliefs have carried over to this new realm and this new age carried by Guinevere um, but now I kind of want to talk about move away from that kind of the rich culture that's kind of established there of this kind of old medieval old way uh, kingdom and talk about why why they fell and in, in turn answer Travis's question I'm going to move back to this this bonfire here and I have free grey rat so that I can move on to the boss. Now there's three things that I think mainly contribute to the downfall of Lothric and I talk about these things separately across the royal bloodlines and the civil war video about the angelic faith that I did like maybe three years ago now at this point. So these three things are there's the failure of the rule ruling bodies and that is of course the monarchy and the three pillars there's there's failings in both of those. The second is the civil war and the civil discord, which I do talk about in that previous video. And this is this is where I'm going to answer your question, Travis. And the third is, of course, the common factor within a lot of kingdoms that fail throughout the, set, the histories of Dark Souls 1, 2 and 3. And that's, of course, the rising dark sign. Now, moving on to the first one, the, the, rule of, the, the failure of the ruling bodies, including the monarchy and their kind of established pillars. Now, they fail in a number of ways. Um, but possibly one of the most important ones for me is that the royal family falls apart. I'm just going to get absolutely hammered here. I cannot play on top at the same time. Yep, dead. So, the royal family falls apart. We know Guinevere leaves. That's what she does. And for that reason, I don't think she's a particularly good character. She's not very strong. Um, not one to kind of hold on and fight and die for what she believes in. She's always kind of escaping. And, and maybe in her, her great wisdom, if you want to call it that, she believes that surviving and um, you know, passing on the message of the old gods is more important. But I don't see how that necessarily is true when, when everything's going to end anyway, as it is in Dark Souls 3. Now, that of course is one. The royal family failing but there's a failure by the three pillars and specifically in the way that they guide the people wow i'm doing terribly terribly well against this uh, great axe guy apologies for that guys I cannot play and talk at the same time it's an art i need to master so guinevere leaves and then the second failure is that the king Os osiris or osiris however you want to pronounce it the consumed king becomes consumed with the research of some aspects of one of the pillars, the, the Scholar Pillar. And this Scholar Pillar essentially um, starts looking into Seath the Pale Drake and his kind of dragon dragon studies and the way of immortality. And this essentially finally killed him. And this essentially possesses uh, Osiris and removes his effective rule. So that's a failing there by the Scholars right there, that their quest for knowledge and, and power essentially tempts the king away from his actual duties. And that is their first failure, but it is not their only failure. So their second failure, the scholars in particular, uh, is in their tutelage of the Prince Lothric, who essentially, as we know from his swaddling clothes, was raised to light the, f light the fire uh, to keep the first flame going. And we know from his uh, from his remains that the, the royal family was obsessed with creating a worthy heir to do this. This is the whole point of this kingdom. Again, they do believe in the old ways and the ways of the old god. And so, of course, relighting the first flame is a, a number one priority. And Lothric was raised to do this. And the reason I say the scholars failed is because he... You see him at the end of the game... My goodness, <laughs> I'm not great at this, am I? Um, you see him at the end of the game, and he really does not agree with this message. He essentially just says, you know what, I'm not up for it. I don't believe it will change anything. I don't care for the prophecies. Let's just let it all burn, uh, or, or not, <laughs> as this case in this one might be. Um, and the reason I, he does, he believes this, in my opinion, and I talk about this in the Royal Blood video, is that he he's misled by one of his tutors 
And once this Lothric Knight leaves me alone for one second, I'll read the item description of the Soul Stream spell, which you get from the Grand Archives. Sorry, I need to concentrate here. Good, another play and fail moment there. Slow down. Um, so yeah, we'll go back to the, the Soul Stream spell. It says... Sor sorcery imparted by the first of the scholars. So it's talking of the first of the scholars. I'm presuming the first among the scholars. The first of the scholars doubted the linking of the fire and was alleged to be a private mentor to the royal prince. So in this little passage, we can see that this scholar, for whatever studies, whatever reasons, doubted the the whole the whole premise, the whole premise of what the you know the original first religion of this uh, country was about. He doubted what it would do and um, this isn't a new idea. And in the video Royal Blood I do talk about the possibility that the first scholar is in fact Aldia from Dark Souls 2. The, the scholar of the first sin was someone who really talked about this idea of why were led to link the fire, like really questioning the whole philosophy of you know what we buy into in Dark Souls. And Aldi is a great character. He's one of the reasons I actually really love Dark Souls too, is that he's a really questioning one who doesn't just believe the dogmas of the gods or of the dark. You know, they they question everything. And Aldia's um, ideas are kind of presented here in this first of first of the scholars' ideas as well. Whether he actually is Aldia somehow surviving through the ages, which I kind of hint at in that video, or whether it's just simply his ideas have made it through teachings. Um, I don't know. That's for that's for kind of you to decide, I guess. Um, and my ideas have changed that a number of times. At a time I did think he was just Aldia, you know, reborn or something, or had survived. But you know, I think it's possible that you know his texts were you know survived in some form, and uh, simply this scholar picked them up and he also passed them on to Lothric. So it's a big failing here. Um, he he essentially he is the most important person in this entire kingdom and he is led astray by the very people who are supposed to teach him on the quote-unquote right path and as a result of this decision and of this teachings he abandons his duty to light, light the fir the relight the first flame and that essentially leaves the kingdom uh, falling to the dark side because the first the first flame is not relit and therefore it suffers the effects, the full effects that we see, you know, the pus of man going absolutely wild. And I'm just taking sanctuary from this night so I can talk to you here. And uh, yeah, Lothric falls to disrepair. So that's a huge failing by the members of the ruling body as well as the monarchy. And so I'm going to go and speak to Emma here who represents essentially one of the other ruling bodies. And that is, of course, the, the priestess, who again were supposed to act as mentors, as guides to Prince Lothric. And again, in a lot of ways, they failed him because they weren't able to keep him on the right path. Uh, they also failed in that I presume they're supposed to be the enforcers of the official religion. Um, but as I move on to the point of the Civil War, you can see that the priestess uh, failed to keep or at least allow for this religion or keep it out. Either or, they allowed this illicit religion, the angelic faith in, which caused a civil disruption uh, in the country, in the kingdom, that led to the other pillar, the knights, being overwhelmed by both the dark sign and the forces of the angelic faith. So let's go and talk to the people. Again, she knows exactly who we are, and she's the high priestess, so presumably the leader of this type of pillar. So we can see here her duplicitous talk. She's claiming there's no Lords of Cinder here. Um, so she's protecting Lothric because she loves him despite his decisions. And the reason that she, she kind of lets you pass later, I mean, she is dying, but she lets you pass and encourages you to go after Lothric because she knows you are the one at this point. At that point, at this point she doesn't. Um, at this point, um, you aren't necessarily the one to do it, so she doesn't want to let you kill them unless you're actually going to fulfill what this kingdom's about, which is, of course, reigniting the first flame. And we've picked up our covenant there, and we're gonna we're gonna stick that on. Um, I don't know why I always kind of like having a covenant icon up there. Call me OCD, whatever you like. And uh, yeah, 
Um, so yeah, feelings on, on the, the, part, the part of the leadership of this country, for sure. I've already talked 40 minutes on that, so I'm going to probably move on to the Civil War aspect. And I'm going to run up here and show Travis um, and explain why I believe there are... Oh God, I cannot play and talk at all. And why I believe that there are, there are these husks everywhere. So, the reason, Travis, is because, as I mentioned in this video, in the just a minute ago there, and then the video I talked about the Civil War and the Angelic Faith, is that there was a Civil War in Lothric. Um, there, are, there are various items that talk about this secondary faith called the Angelic Faith. Gertrude is locked in the cell above the Grand Archives, the, you know, the centre of the scholars, one of the pillars, one of the arms of authority who deign it uh, necessary to imprison her. Um, and I'm just going to read the, ar the, uh, the item description for the armour of the winged knights, who are the big fat guys with wings who walk around. It says, armour of the winged knights who swore themselves to angels. Worship of the divine messengers was viewed as heresy in Lothric and unrecognised by any of the three pillars of rule. So, it's a heretical belief, and I'm not going to get into what it is. Uh, I do do a whole video on that. Um, my ideas haven't changed hugely on it. We don't. I still don't think we technically know what the angels are, um, but whatever it is, it's that it is a heretical belief, uh, and it's against the kind of dogma of this community, of this kingdom, like I said, much like medieval communities. And so we can see these husks that you're talking about here, Travis. And this is, to me, a sign of a civil war fought between this big guy here and the Knights of Lothric. And I imagine I'm going to do terribly against him due to my absolute failing of being able to talk and play it. Good, I got past him. Okay. And this scene here is kind of the most important part here. So I'm just going to kill the, kill the spares here, as Voldemort would say. So, <clears throat> you see these dead knights everywhere, Travis. And then you see amongst them this knight, this angelic knight, who has been stabbed a number of times, but most noticeably by this weapon here. And this is a weapon of a Lothric knight. And this chap is obviously one that fell victim to many a blade. And we know that they are powerful, and they are certainly probably more more powerful for whatever reason than the Lothric knights, which is why maybe these five or six knights uh, were were only able to take them down together, and why there's one big guy there surrounded by a lot of Lothric knights. And I hope that armor description kind of kind of answers your question, Travis. This is a heretical religion that undermined the authority of the royal family, and of course this led to a conflict between one of the pillars, the military pillar, the knights, and the angelic knights, who were essentially the militia of this uh, fanatical group who, of war angel worshippers. And um, not going too much further into it, that is essentially why there's a lot of bodies around. Um, the dark sign was abound, as I've said, the, the, the ruling bodies had failed the country and this uh, civil war erupted. And as we can see from the scenes right here, it was obviously quite a, a devastating civil war. Quite a violent one. And um, I don't think it went particularly well for the Lothar Knights, although of course it looks like the Lothar Knights are still here in their undead form, so probably they ultimately won. Um, but I imagine this was a, a fairly devastating, fairly devastating conflict for the, the authorities at the time. We're just going to run past all these spares and we're just going to go ahead and fight um, fight the boss here. So I hope that answers your question, Travis. And that is, of course, a, a major, major factor in why the kingdom began to fail. This pro-Gwen, pro... Even if they didn't know it was they, you know, particularly Gwen, they, they were pro, you know, re-lighting the fire. Certainly. And, um, yeah. Then, of course, there's the dark sign. The third and final point, um, as a downfall, many, many kingdoms in the lore of this game. And you see the passive man. This this is the, the end of times in Dark Souls 3. The strength of the dark is getting so much stronger. Um, and, yeah, the passive man even infecting the dragons. The beloved steeds of the, the you know, the third pillar. Um, you can see how... How bad it is at this stage. Apologies. And um, that's why it fell. All those reasons. So, moving on from that, I'm going to start answering the Q&A while I get my ass kicked while trying to play and talk against Fort here. And the first question comes from my friend uh, Dark, Dark Blood Souls. And he asks a pretty simple but very important question. 
for all of us humans who have a, a kind of um, you know holding in this game is are humans better off under the age of dark and it's a great question and there are a lot of bits of evidence for yes and no kind of um, objectively in this game but then also it kind of depends on your like you know theological bend so I'm going to start off to some signs why it might not be that great and I'm sure this is ones that you've all kind of talked about but let's just kind of chat about it again so let's go, go to the obvious and that's Ulusiel so that's kind of the first in all the games where we see what the world might look like under the age of dark and you know well, that was surprising that I managed to beat him first time while talking so while we enjoy the the fruits of our victory there so it looks bad in the Ulusiel kind of event in that it's chaotic but change is chaotic I'm going to kind of come back to that this is a kind of chaotic unnatural event that happens in Ulusiel but it, it may lead you to believe that it's not maybe the dark isn't as good as it's previously sold um, by Kath uh, earlier on um, it's rampant you can see humans have had their heads exploded with you know, rampant humanity that's gone wild and then we see that in Lothric actually as well I was talking about that the passive man and if you don't know what the passive man is sorry that is the, the kind of dark human human snakes that come out of some of the various undead and out of Grundir at the beginning of the game and as far as I can tell, I mean, there's nothing that really specifically talks about it, but as far as I can tell, the pus of man is essentially humanity gone wild. Um, I think that kind of is very much implied. Uh, given that this is the end of days and everything's a lot more extreme in Dark Souls 3 than it has been in any of the other games, I think it's fair to say that the pus of man is an example of humanity going wild, much like it does in Dark Souls 1 in Ulusiel. So we can see that maybe the dark isn't that great, there's of course hollowing, um, and you know, like a kingdom of hollows, like the the Church of Londor, um, want to have, might not be that great. You know, you might not think a church, a land of hollows, is that great. So, of course, by comparison, the age of the gods might seem like a golden age of light and you know, of intelligence and building and civilization. But I'm going to move on to now why I think maybe it might not be the best thing. So. The rule of the gods and the age of light is quite oppressive to humanity in a lot of ways. And before we carry on, I just want to say that this view is phenomenal. And if you haven't taken it in, you really should. Because every time I play through the game, I always try and spot every location that you're going to go to in the game. So that building there to my right is the Cathedral of the Deep. Below me is the Keep of Farron. That is the bridge there that used to connect Lothric to the rest of the world. Um, and the, there's a, a demon down there, the ash kind of demon, that's guarding everything. Uh, that is the, the crypts there. Um, that is the township there. And right at the back, that building with the big tree is where you fight the the, the big tree. I can't remember the exact name at this, point, at this point. The cursed tree. To the left there, through the mist, you can kind of see it poking at the top. That is An Orlando there. Or... The, the old Anne Orlando, and right on the mountain top there, in the distance, below that kind of tall mountain, in the kind of middle mountain range there, I don't know if you can quite see it, that is the Dragon Shrine, that is the that is where you can kind of go to if you meditate while in Erythil Dungeon. So you can see the entire locations of this game, and I just think that this this visual piece here is beautiful, and the, the From Software have really done itself and, and one of the things I, I've always loved about Dark Souls I've never said it's the most visually stunning game but their vistas are always incredible and the way you can kind of see all the lands and I just think the view and the artwork's brilliant and this bit really kind of speaks to me we're going to raise the banner now and move across so yeah back, back, to, your, back to your question Dark Blood Souls um, so if we look at Lothric for example this isn't even a direct rule of the gods apart from Guinevere of course it's like another inheritance it just shows how Gwen's manipulation has lasted through the years and the age of light is quite oppressive to humanity it makes us go against our our natural nature whether you you kind of like the age of light or, you, or you're an age of dark person um, we undeniably are creatures of dark we are the inheritors of the dark soul in a lot of ways Lothric is an example of what happens when there's a level of intolerance that you, you have, there's a dogma that you have to adhere to 
and the way of the gods and the way of light has always been very dogmatic, much more so than the, the, the way of the dark. And you can see the kind of intolerance that happens even with the angelic faith, which we don't know is if aligned to the dark, or if it's just another faith. We don't really know much about it, to be honest. So, good things about the Age of Dark, in my opinion, um, is that we are, of course, undeniably of the dark. And Dark Souls 3 is a great example of what is happening to the world when you deny the natural order of things. At the Kiln of the First Flame, you see all the worlds, all the cities, all the timelines churning together like the beginning of an event horizon. And it's not good, it's, it's what's happening to the universe against our nature. So an age of dark would allow the world to take its natural course and maybe ultimately would be better for everyone involved, including ourselves. So I think that is definitely a, a point in its favour, is that it is a nat it was the natural kind of progression at this point. And dogs. Excuse me for a second. Well, incredible gameplay, small town. Um, Hollowing also may have been a negative point up until now. However, we can kind of learn in this game that hollowing can be harnessed and that hollows aren't as mindless as we thought. When you, you take the mantle of the, the Lord of Hollows, it, when you usurp the fire um, and become the Lord of Hollows, you're not mindless. I mean, you are a hollow, but it's kind of changed our perspective on hollowing. And hollowing might not be as bad as we th might have thought it was at one point. And at this point, I just like apologise for the poor gameplay. It's certainly something I need to work on. Um, but, but, you know, it's just a casual bit of gameplay. I've never kind of claimed to be a pro Dark Souls player. Um, but anyway, yeah, if Hollowing's maybe not as bad as we thought it would be. We can see, you know, a lot of, um, you know, clever, intelligent things being done by Hollows in this game, including tricking people, um, tactics we see with the rings, how they can pretend to be normal, unhollowed people, things like that and that there's a whole kingdom which suggests that they can build and organize and maybe there's different levels of hollowing that we that we never knew of before and you know this suggests that maybe hollowing isn't as bad and that was kind of one of the things that put us off initially from having an age of dark so yeah again might not be as bad as we thought and in fact in this get this playthrough if we continue this exact playthrough on this series i am going to go for the the lord of hollows ending because I haven't done it in a while actually, I was doing the kind of Age of Dark innings up to this point. So I'm going to speak to Yol of Nondor here. Oh my goodness me, man. He's... No matter what Dark Souls you're playing, no matter what Dark Souls you're playing or Bloodborne you're playing, dogs remain the most irritating animals ever since Demon Souls. My god, they're annoying. I love dogs in real life, man, but this is too much. Come on. There we go. Cool, just burned through three Estes flasks, killing the dogs outside the undead settlement. And I'll be back to my point while I speak to Yule of Londor here. Um, Halloween can be harnessed, and it's obviously not as bad as we thought. Um, although it's not, you, you might not want to look like a piece of, of uh, beef jerky. Um, it certainly it looks like there's now worse things, and then it might just be our natural state and that we if we can learn to harness it like we do in the kind of final Lord of Hollows ending then you know maybe it's not so bad um, we have mentioned the, unnet, the unnatural extension there in part so I, I think that the kind of natural order is being disturbed by the extension of the age of fire over and over again it's unnatural the world is being bent and churned and it kind of needs to end one way or the other at this point, whether you agree with the Dark Age or not. And finally, there's not just the hollowing point, but if you've played the, the kind of the end of fire ending, um, which a lot of people kind of maybe think that there's the true ending, where you just let the light go out with the, the fire keeper, it's a very calm ending, isn't it? Um, more so than any of the other endings I've played, and I suggest you play it if you haven't. It's a very nice quiet ending um, where everything just goes still dark and quiet it's not rampant madness like a new seal it's just a nice quiet natural peaceful dark which a lot of kind of the phrases that have been used alongside some of the natural dark like we've seen um, in Dark Souls 2 and Nishandra 
uh, apparently brings a peaceful dark uh, to the kingdom of Dryn Lake. So, an interesting point, interesting question there, uh, Dark Blood Souls, and I think that we would be. I think that the Age of Light has gone along enough, um, and the main point is that we would be in control of our own destinies. I feel like we're still, in a lot of ways, puppets of the old lords and of the old gods, uh, and it's led to a very dogmatic society. So, absolutely. So, I will read the next question before I move on with uh, this thrilling and uh, technically skilled gameplay. Uh, from Santiago Marino. Uh, a little off topic, but can you talk more about the connections of Dark Souls 2 to Dark Souls 3? And I would be delighted to. There's, there's a few that are really interesting. Um, and I'll start with kind of le the least important ones, kind of the little kind of fan service ones. And uh, there's there's descendants from Dran Lake that survive into this game who are called the Dragon Knights, who are the ones that kind of wear. Uh, those black kind of um, King Vendrick like cloaks and wield the dual weapons. So once I've killed this little pitchfork wielder, I'll read one of the item descriptions. So the, the paired hammers says paired hammers of the Drang Knights, descendants from the land known for the legend of the Linking of the Fire. So Drang Knights, Drang Lake, it's you know the land of the legend of the Linking of the Fire. This, of course, uh, this legend is, of course, Dark Souls 2 is very much about what does it mean to link the fire? What happens then? What are the cycles for? What is our purpose? That is a lot of the theme in that game, and I, I really like that theme, actually. I think it's another, I think there's some great themes introduced in Dark Souls 2. I'm not a Dark Souls hater at all, Dark Souls 2 hater at all. Um, and I think that that's, a, that's an important point that makes it through is that Drang Lake is known in this game, so it obviously was, you know, it's not, it's not a fan fiction that game, it very much did happen. So of course, that's one connection is that Drang Lake's alive, uh, it survived, um, or Drang Lake people survived and are descendants and they're now known as Drang rather than Drang Lake. The Faram Knights um, existed um, in this world, again they're canon, and their armour survived and their legend survived, because the Faram set tells us the armour of the Frost Align Knights was preserved even after the destruction of their homeland. Uh, and this is kind of the state of the lore that we had in, in Dark Souls 2, so the, their legend is as well known now as it was then. Um, and then it says, and is mentioned in numerous legends, alongside those who are said to have gone beyond death. So, went beyond death is a referencing to, first of all, the marketing material for Dark Souls 2. I remember this marketing material very clearly, because I actually quite, I, I thought... The marketing campaign for Dark Souls 2 was very, very good. They obviously put a lot of money into it. And they had that tagline, Go Beyond Death. Now I'm going to handle these little twerps. Continually annoy me. Um, yes, there you go. Oh, okay, apparently not moved. Good. Um, and um, yeah, the trailers had a lot of this kind of Go Beyond Death tagline. So that's a reference to that. And of course, it's also a reference to what it means to hollow, which is again a big question posed in Dark Souls 2. What it means to hollow, what does hollowing mean? So that theme survives in this game as well, and that kind of legend passes on. So third is possible Aldia connection, which is what I talked about before, so it's good that, that that's come up. Um, so he was the scholar of the first Senate and the brother of King Vendrick, and he was a great researcher into the cycle, uh, the relighting of the first flame, and what it means to to make those decisions. And he was a great character. I think he's one of the best characters in the whole series. And like I said there, his teachings at least, maybe himself, and that's has got um, our poor buddy's wife there, uh, wife's remains there. Uh, he might have survived himself, but I'm now kind of leaning towards the explanation that it's just his teachings have survived. But either way, his kind of, you know, philosophies have made it into this game, and that's kind of a connection from Dark Souls 2 as well is that his philosophy survived. Failing with these firebombs here. So that's another connection. The scholar of the first sin's teaching survived from Dark Souls 2. And just kill some of these guys. Uh, four is kind of Carla um, mentions something in this game that kind of made me think that it, again it's another little lore point from Dark Souls 2 and that is she says that she's a fragment of the dark um, and this particular language and description of talking about the dark is very much the way in which Nishandra 
and the other kind of DLC Daughters of Manus were described as they were kind of fragments of Manus and fragments of the Abyss. So this again might be a lower point that survived from Dark, Soul Dark Souls 2 and that Carla is in fact um, another fragment of Manus. Um, but take that as well, that is just my reading of that tiny, tiny, tiny like use of that word. Um, and five, the most important thing that survives from Dark Souls 2, and they're not things about the, the, the things from Dark Souls 2, is they're not obvious the things that survive from that. I feel like the most important thing that we get from Dark Souls 2, and this is very pervasive in this game, as it drives kind of the main overarching issue in this game, um, is that the cyclical nature of the worlds and the straining of the world and what happens when we relink the fire and that this age is just one of many um, that have come before us and that many people have linked the fire which is of course the, the theme of the final boss as well that comes from Dark Souls 2 and um, the Dark Souls 1 didn't have that idea yet uh, this was that was just the age it was just the the dawn of the age of dark at that point then you could relight the fire Dark Souls 2 um, very interestingly just introduces the idea that this is now the way of things it's a, oh goodness, a recycling of nature, recycling of souls, recycling of the worlds and many kingdoms, many lords and the souls that those lords use are recycled and reborn over and over again. That very much is a Dark Souls 2 theme. So that is a connection between Dark Souls uh, 2 and Dark Souls 3. And so I hope that that answers your question there. Um, yeah, it's that, that those are the main connections I see. The, the cyclical one, of course, being a major theme in this game, and that that was introduced in Dark Souls too. Um, finally, I've got another question from Charles Smith, who asked me one last week. Let me just pause here at this gate to read this. He says, I have been a little confused recently, pondering the end of the old hunters in Bloodborne. Um, so we're moving across to, to Bloodborne, I hope no one minds. Um, if Koss or some Cosm cursed Bergenworth scholars for killing her, why does slaying her orphan child lift this curse? Um, and that's a good question, uh, but one that I feel like I may have stumbled across the other day. I was watching a TV show where the nature of curses came up and how to break them. And a lot of curses are connected by the, the person who made the curse and their blood. So in this case one of the most basic ways of breaking a curse may be to slay the one who has created the curse or their surviving blood. And their surviving blood in this case is the orphan. So in slaying the orphan and destroying the blood that creates the curse, because curses have a lot to do in apparently a lot of myths and religions to do with blood and blood ties and they're made by blood that if you slay that blood then the curse is no more and I, I genuinely believe that that's the point of you killing the orphan is, is kind of horrible as it may be in that, that a lot of respects that you're killing the child this beautiful murdered creature um, is that you're, you're essentially breaking the curse because there's now no blood to tie that curse to reality anymore and that's what I believe and I hope that answers your question Charles I just before you ask this question, I've actually been watching a show where this kind of this kind of question was asked as well, uh, and that was that was the answer. Um, so hope that's answered your question, and I believe that's me come to the end of the Q and A, and this video has gone for a good time. Um, I apologise for my abhorrent gameplay. I really need to work on being able to answer questions. Um, but hey, well, we've made it past the the boss, and we're into the next area now, so it's not all bad. I hope you enjoyed my my ramblings about various topics. I certainly enjoy playing. Um, please leave your comments on how we can improve this series and leave any questions you may have for the next one. Thanks guys, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Bye.